Welcome to the dark forest. Jackie and her pals will never bore us. Shameless confessions about our obsession will make us laugh and smile. So let's explore the dark forest and dork down for a while. Hi, it's Jackie Cation. Welcome to the Dork Forest. You know the websites, JackieCation.com, DorkForest.com. Patrick Brady's going to fix this audio. Mike Rickberg just sang. He's going to sing again at the end with his girlfriend, Sarah Cohen. Very good lady. And Vilmos fixes the websites. So know in your hearts that it is November or December. And so in November and December, there's a donation button on my website and on DorkForest.com. And I usually ask for donations every episode. In November and December, I ask that you don't donate to the Dork Forest. You instead uh, donate locally. If you were going to give me 20 bucks or 100 bucks or whatever you're going to give me, just donate it to your local food bank or the hurricane people or anybody. There's a lot of a lot of places, obviously, that you can uh, toys for tots, this type of thing. And it's, you know, but if you do want to buy a Christmas gift or a solstice gift or a Hanukkah gift or an atheist gift or of t-shirts or CDs, there is the merch page on JackieCation.com. Feel free to get any of the variety of t-shirts that I now have available. You got your Ranger logo, Ranger of the Dork Forest t-shirt, which has dorky things coming out of the forest. Those are, everything's U.S. made, by the way, made here in this country, either by union members or non-union members, but at least not made by toddlers. I'm wearing clothes made by toddlers. I'm not above it. I'm just above selling it. So um, you can get a Ranger t-shirt, which are black, or you can get a brown or green The Dork Forest t-shirt designed by Brett Chambers, which has um, a D12 on it and elvish writing saying, I have found it, because you have found The Dork Forest, really. And then my two CDs, Circus People, my first real CD, and it is about 40 minutes, and it has an embedded video of me doing The Dork Forest bit for my half-hour Comedy Central special without the benefit of copyright. And then my current album, which is It Is Never Going To Be Bread, which was top 10 comedy albums of the year when it came out, which was in 2010, which means I should get a new one out, but I don't have any. And as per usual, come and see me do stand-up comedy. All through November and December, I'm going to be in Arizona, and then I'm going to be a lot in Los Angeles, and then in January, I'm going to New York for a podcast festival and to do sets, and in Toronto, I'm going to go to Canada. Very exciting. Thank you so much for listening to The Dork Forest. I hope you have a good holiday season and take care of each other out there. And donate to me in January, but don't worry about it this month. Just enjoy the show, which is about to begin. Hi, it's Jackie Cation. I'm sitting here with Julie Hall. Is it Hoverson? Hoverson, yeah. I went long O. I went long O. What the heck? Hey, I've had people say Hooverson, Hoverson, Holverson. I'm like, no, no, no. Like There's Christmas, no L. Like Christmas, I have no L. And there, then they, yeah. sometimes they don't get it. No. They do what they can. Yeah. So um, we met, I think it was on Podcast Squared, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. We were on the uh, dis- roundtable discussion of women in podcasting. Oh, that's right. That's yeah, right. Cause along he was... with the woman from the Court TV show. Right. Oh. Um, I can't remember. Uh, yeah, a close personal friend of mine whose name has spaced me. Put it in the notes. It'll be great. And I should have, it's Sharon Houston. And I will have Sharon Houston on the show uh, another time talking about, I've tried to ask her if she wants to come on and talk about Court TV. And she's like, well, I don't know what I talk about. And I was like, teeth. Uh, court TV or teeth. You could, I, a tooth dork. I don't have a, I don't have a dental, well, I haven't well, had a is, dental dork That was yet. one of her best stories. <laughs> Oh, was it? About the teeth. And I listened to a couple of episodes of her show. Yeah. And they talked about how they had to give teeth to some of the people who come on the show because they, they don't, don't want have to... any teeth and they don't want it to be some sort of stereotype about, oh, crying out loud. <laughs> you know, that is free teeth. That's part of the perk, because you know what? No one's giving back their teeth after they've... Well, the problem is because they're just, like, snapping teeth. Oh, they're not real? They don't get them real? Well, of course not, because it's core TV and there's no... <laughs> And there's no budget, but uh, one of the things they should negotiate for is actual dental work. Oh, you betcha. What about that? Uh, that would be It's funny. not just $150 to come on and air your personal laundry uh, in front of Court <laughs> TV people. Do you ever watch Court TV? Oh, once in a blue moon. I don't, uh, I've never, I, I already know people that are making bad life decisions. I have uh, a hard time true. watching them uh, talk about it and defend themselves. 
indefensible, by the way, almost oh, always. Oh, Lord, sometimes. I watch it sometimes as fodder, though, for what I write for my show. That's oh, the right. reason I keep details like the teeth thing is because in my head somewhere, that's going to show up in a story somewhere. Oh, very nice. So let's do it. 19nocturneboulevard.com mm-hmm. is essentially you write radio plays. Yes. Is that true? Okay. Yeah. And so it's a podcast of sorts, but it's actors and there's drama. Well, we usually call them audio dramas, because if yeah. I tell people I write radio shows, then their first question is, oh, what channel are you on? Right, right, because people station, don't yeah. understand podcasting. I've had more people, matter of fact, this week in Seattle, because we're in Seattle, ladies and gentlemen, at the Courtyard Marriott here in Kirkland, and um, but the, uh, not sponsored by them, but <laughs> yeah, I've had more people come up and say, what is a podcast? This week, than in a long time, and I thought that they were becoming more common. It's... It's interesting what where you run into people who are less podcast savvy. Yeah. yeah. But even, you know, even explaining podcasting, you still have to take it one step farther to explain audio drama because right. audio drama is sort of a little tide pool at the very edge of podcasting as yet. I should imagine because it's so much more work, I think, isn't it? It is a lot of work. Right, because you have to... Well, just we, write it. Write it. <laughs> then you cast it, you know, give all the parts to the actors. Right. Now... Now, do oh, you have a stable of actors? Uh, sort of, yeah. yeah, yeah. So I mean, we, we it's everybody It's the early studio system, and you are Lou Wasserman. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> something like that. Well, I mean, I have uh, core people who are like my go-to people in case of emergency, and I make sure that I give them good roles from time to time, because that's, you know, part of how you... Yeah, yeah. It's the reciprocation there. Yeah. Uh, but also, they are good actors, and so it's... Right, you know, right. It's not like I'm just handing roles to... No, no, that wouldn't make any sense. Name. Yeah, but that, would, that, that wouldn't make any sense at all. As if, you're exactly. like, no, no, I need people to be good, but you also, like, because you, you built sort of a theater group, right? Mm-hmm. And that's, that's like, people who act a lot, not me, Jackie Kishin, <laughs> I do stand-up a lot. That's what I realize is that people who want to act, they uh, find people like you and go, true. I want to act. What I will be the second uh, soldier holding a spear yep. on the left just to get to. Oh, yeah. And with audio drama, it's nice because they can be all over the world. Oh, right. Because the way we... uh, Some groups do record in studio and they do everything more like a regular theater troupe. Like We're Alive, which is one of the biggest audio dramas out there right now, which is a zombie series. Okay. And um, they're out of... uh, Down out of L.A., or at least in California. I think it's L.A. where they're at. And uh, they're amazing. I mean, they've got a huge following, but they're also really good at marketing, and they're really reliable. They come out on time all the time. You know, oh, they're, oh they're so they're very, consistent. Yes, and they're very professional. They have very professional actors in their right. show. You know, wow. others of us out here. Now, I've, up until this last summer, I was generally very regular. Right, how long have you been doing it? I've been doing this for just over four years. Okay. Um, my first shows debuted in October of 2008. Okay. But I actually started making them about uh, almost a year earlier. Right, because, okay, so, yeah, yeah. so... The production. Well, because well, uh, for me, it was sort of a long road to get involved in a strange way. I was with a group called American Radio Theater, which did old-time radio reenactments. Okay. And they, the problem with old-time radio reenactments is any sort of really good meaty roles for females are few and far between. It right. really sucks. Oh, that's too bad, because you'd think there'd be a lot of Amelia Earhart. You no, know, the problem being... is the problem is that most of what you end up doing are like detective stories or whatever, and then the woman is the client the or the sidekick yeah. or the or the secretary or something. Yeah, the, and, the, that's it. I think. Yeah, right? pretty much those three, something like that. You know, yeah. and while and while there are some really great sidekicks, I mean, well, okay, who's uh, a really good sidekick? Let like, George do it was a radio serial that lasted a really long time. And uh, Claire Brooks, the sidekick in that, I hold that she is the best female sidekick in all of old-time radio, but that's my opinion. And Let George Do It is an actual old-time radio yes. fr- from the old days? Yes. Like in the 30s? or uh, 40s, 50s. 40s and 50s. And, and it's... And Claire... Claire Brooks was the character. Oh, was the character? Or Brooksy. That's what they call That's what he right. called her. Okay. Oh, you know, it's it's the classic. He's not exactly a detective. He's more sort of a troubleshooter. Okay. Um, he, he has an ad in the paper that says, you know, you have a problem, let me handle it, let George do it. You know? Okay. Oh, right. And and so, and she's his sidekick, secretary, whatever. I mean, Personal they, assistant. Yeah. Yeah, basically. There you go. And there was like the sort of the romance thing that they kind of forced into the story because everyone had to have they? it. Yeah, yeah. 
It's uh, but, for Fen, people just work together. Yeah, well, uh, in this case, it was more like every once in a while she would hint that there should be a romance, you know. Oh, okay. And the audience <laughs> were all like, ah, ha, 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 and he would be like, I don't know what you're talking about. You know? <laughs> but but she was a cool hero. She was a cool sidekick because she didn't do all the stupid screamy nonsense. She didn't, oh, you know, right. she was, she was, she actually helped solve things. She was, you know. Okay. So anyway. That's, so they you know, gave her an actual character instead of just yeah. uh, being a boot. Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, so many of them, the, the girl is just there for the guy to explain things to. Are you willing to say which ones those, like old timey ones that are? Oh, it's, it's hard to even think of. The, like, have you, you know, always been into it? Have you always listened well, to them? Or? Okay. I got into old time radio. <laughs> it's going even a few steps further back. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> it's Bill Cosby's fault. Okay. Because he did a routine about the chicken heart. Okay, I vaguely, I don't know the bit, but I, I vaguely know the... When he talked about when he was a child and Lights Out, which was which is one of the best horror series from the old time radio, Okay, would come on the air, and one night, you know, and how he'd climb out of his crib and go turn on the 500 dials on the radio, and the chicken heart came on and scared the heck out of him. You oh, know? yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, okay. boom, 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 boom. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that cracked me up so bad. And so in high school, I was doing, you know, part-time work at a thrift store, and in comes an LP of Lights Out. Oh. And we happened to have a record player. My dad did. So, yeah. you know, bought it. My brother and I put it on, turned all the lights, and it was actually really good. It wasn't the chicken heart, but it was really good. Okay. So after that, I started looking for old-time radio. That's it. Yeah. Yep. Classic. And they also had an LP of Jack Benny and Fred Allen, and I went back and bought those the next day. Right. right. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. Those are great. And actually, yes. As a, Jack Benny is a better introduction to comedy than Fred Allen, because Fred Allen was sort of like the Jay Leno of his day. So a lot of his stuff is very time-based. I mean, oh, based on... Oh, is he's common, topical? Yeah. Okay. A lot of his stuff was very topical, and so Didn't it's a lot harder. did supposedly have, like, a fake oh, war? Oh, a feud between those two. Yeah. yeah they like just made fun feud. of each okay. other constantly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But Jack Benny was more generically funny. Well, right. Fred Allen. Anyway, more consistently, just uh, and it holds up better. It, it does because you opinion. don't have to know what he's talking about all oh, the there time. You, go. Yeah, you know, because yeah. Fred Allen makes some comment about, uh, you know, the like, Stevenson. fabric rash, <laughs> no, fabric rationing during World War II, and you just sit there and go, "What?" Okay. <laughs> you know, well, I would love that actually. <laughs> I love World War II weird, yeah. obscure references. Yeah. Uh, that's because of course they rationed fabric. They rationed everything, right? Well, yeah, and that's what that's what Zoot Suit Riots came from. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, because Zoot Suits were. I, I know I wander all over the place. This no, is uh, I, that I, is I, uh, <laughs> welcome to the Dork Forest. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have this tendency to collect up random bits of weird information constantly. Because you're going to use them. Yeah, because they show up in my shows. Yeah. And, there really were zoot suit riots, apparently, because what happened is with fabric rationing, it actually told you you could have two yards and five inches of fabric in your suit. Okay. Period. Because the wool had to be saved for the uniforms. Right. So zoot suits, which used incredible piles of fabric because yeah. they're so huge, were a protest against fabric rationing. So oh. army guys saw them as un-American. Oh, and so there would be so, fights. Yeah, so whenever the Army, Navy was in town, whatever, they would beat the crap out of anybody they found in a zoot suit because they were un-American. Right, right, because you were not believing in, it's like, I, I'm i wearing a threadbare sh uh, thing as I go into Germany, and yeah. you, I've got a thousand pounds of suit, yep. and you're also not in the Army. <laughs> so, uh, what year were the zoot suit riots? Uh, somewhere in the 40s. Somewhere in the 40s, Somewhere yeah. during the war, it would Somewhere during the war, yeah. yeah. There's one in one of... Um, Oh, I can see his name. The author, the guy who wrote L.A. Confidential. Okay. I don't know. Oh, anyway. Uh, one of, one of his other books opens with a Zoot Suit Riot, actually. Oh, okay. So, oh, that's neat. Yeah. He wrote, he's a, oh, it's going to come to me the minute I drive off today. But anyway. <laughs> I'll put it in the notes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he writes very dark cop dramas. Okay. Noir type, but mostly yeah, focused yeah. around cops in that era. Um, so... Anyway, so that's how you started listening to it because of yeah. Bill Cosby. Yes, and then you just and then getting into the old time radio. Then I got into the old time radio recreation group, you know, and I got my friend Ray in, who mm -hmm. you know we've known each other since high school, and so he I know he acts, so I got him into it. Okay. Then late two thousand seven or thereabouts, he auditioned for and got into an online audio drama called The Unspeakable and Inhuman. Okay. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's this long chain of events. Of course. So, you know, and I had been writing a couple scripts 
in an old time radio style mm-hmm. for the the recreation group. Oh, okay. And had won a couple of like honorable mentions in the National Audio Theater Festival script writing contest. The National Audio what? Uh, What's that National happened? Audio <laughs> Theater Festival. I. Where is that festival? Does it move? It, no, it's somewhere... Oh, gosh. I keep picturing the middle of the continent somewhere. Mm-hmm. I'm terrible. Because if it's not here, it's just there. It's somewhere else. It's somewhere I'm not going. Okay. So, so you, <laughs> nobody ever goes. It's just Oh, no. A lot of people do. go. Oh, they actually no, go. No, it's but... actually very huge. It's for... it's That one is aimed at old-time radio enthusiasts. Still. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so that's, it's like a con. It's a convention. Yeah, it essentially is. Yeah. Okay, neat. And they get... Like radio professionals and audiobook reading professionals okay. and, you know, other people to come in and talk or talk about writing or to do a couple of performances of, like, the winning scripts and things, okay. I think. I, like I said, I haven't gone. Right, right. But that's, but, but you've obviously seen yeah. posts. Yeah. And, uh, and so all of this is happening over the internet? A lot. We'll see now. I mean, getting into the audio dramas, the the internet audio dramas. Oh, a lot of us are more into the what we're doing on the internet. The things like the National Audio Theater Festival. I think they're still geared more toward real quote unquote radio and old time radio stuff. I, oh, I this have is exi- I, already existing like old yeah. timey stuff. Okay. I just I there's a lot a lot of the groups that actually organize and have conventions tend to be more of that old school thing, okay. which is kind of a, I mean, and I, they may have changed since the last time I looked, but sure. that's generally what I have gotten as a sense from them because they kind of just don't want to be bothered with all us amateurs putting out junk on the internet. Or the new stuff that's coming out. Like, yeah. But, the, but that's so weird because you would think that if they love that old stuff so much, they'd be like, let there be, let's do this. It's a but, purist thing, and yeah. you know, and and maybe it's changing. I just don't bother with them either. So. Right there, you go exactly. <laughs> and you you write your own thing, and you do your own thing. Yeah. So how many um, were you putting them out like once every three months? Oh no no no, it? mine were coming out every two weeks. Okay, which right. is insane. So that is insane. That's a, a even lot. other producers like how think long I'm are insane. the scripts? Half an hour, roughly. Okay, All I was right. putting out a half hour every two weeks. For a while, I was even doing more because I had a short series that was coming out like ten minutes every week at the same time. Okay. I don't know where I found that much energy. And, right. And you were recording uh, via Skype, or what were you? No, no. Actually, what we do is what we call satellite recording. Now, I do have actors who I bring into my living room and we record. Sure. Some roles I just really want to be able to direct. Okay. You know, I want yeah. them to be there so I can get the, get what I want out of that character. Because yep. sometimes it really does matter. Yeah. You know. Other times it's because, like, one of the other... Sh- I, I actually... 19 Nocturne Boulevard is actually my flagship show. That's like my Twilight Zone. Okay. It's an anthology. Every story kind of stands alone. Okay. Oh, it's just, it's, it's a series of, of short yeah. pieces? Is yes. that what it is? Okay. Yeah. Very That'd much be- like the Twilight Zone, but within it, there are characters who show up in two or three episodes. Okay. So there's like sub-series so, within right, it. Right, like recurring re- re- yeah. recurring series, uh, but, yeah. they're, but they're short pieces. How well, long? they're like, they're well, they're all half an hour. Well, they're, well okay, 19 Nocturnes... They run from, you know, 20 to 45 minutes, roughly. I mean, because right. it's the internet, I don't have to stick to and a it's certain just, time right, block. But it's just one piece yeah. each time. So yeah. you're like, okay, so this is essentially a 20 to 40 minute mm-hmm. episode yep. of this thing. Yeah. Okay. So a lot of them are standalone stories. I've done a lot of adaptations from H.P. Lovecraft, from okay. William Hope Hodgins. From, I, you know. I just heard of H.P. Lovecraft about five oh. years ago, and I've never read any of his stuff. But uh, I tried to read some L. Ron Hubbard, who was a, uh, a contemporary. Pulp L. Ron Fiction-y. Hubbard's a little later. It's, uh, but they, but they were they they had Pulp Fiction at the same time, but it was pre the the famous Lovecrafty stuff. I don't know. I, I thought, I did, I I thought didn't Hubbard was more forties. No, no, he he wrote in the in the late twenties. Oh, told. okay. And it was uh, because uh, my husband Andy made uh, a video game out of one of his pulp. Um, one of his one of his pulp mysteries, and uh-huh. he comes home, and, and it was when he had first gone contract, and he uh-huh. said, "Hey, I've been asked to do this," and I said, "For the Church of Scientology?" And he goes, <laughs> "I'm not working for the Church of Scientology. I'm making this video game for the people who own the L. Ron Hubbard." Uh, and I was like, "Yeah, that would be the Church of Scientology. What are you doing?" And he's hey. like, "Leave me alone." And uh, hey, so, if you get paid, that's what matters. Well, that's right? what happened, and uh, <laughs> and he made it, and it was, and he liked. It. So well, that's cool. Right. No, um. Lovecraft was Lovecraft was actually a very pivotal figure in horror. Okay, yeah. And even though his his oeuvre Ex- is fairly to small. To people who don't know who Lovecraft is, <laughs> because I don't know enough okay, about him. To if know. you've ever heard the word Cthulhu, 
Right. Or you've ever heard the word Necronomicon? Okay. Uh, the book, the Necronomicon, or Cthulhu, the great evil elder god. Um, okay, so you know, Cthulhu's a monster. Cthulhu, and, yeah. And, yeah. Um, and uh, the, the Necronomicon uh, is a fictional book that yes. he made up yes. that was so horrible you couldn't read it or you'd go mad really? or something? No, it was actually, it was, it was essentially a... A book about, you know, dealing with the elder gods and how to, you know, summon them and stuff. Okay. It wasn't necessarily the book that made you mad. It was more like if you were insane, you'd want to read the book. <laughs> no. Oh, okay. You know? yeah. But, but it, it's, it, it, was, it, it was so full of horrific lore that, um, you know, it had to be locked away so that people oh, okay. couldn't get their hands on it. Because they might summon up the end of the world. Oh, accidentally yeah. or on purpose because they were Usually bangers. on purpose, yeah. Right. Just, I don't ever understand that sort of mentality. I really don't. It's or like just some the end of the world. Yeah, I'm more like I'm more like do you remember um did you ever watch Buffy the Vampire Slayer? I did. I uh, remember Spike yes. it, because he's like I don't know why people want to end the world. I like the world. All the people in it. Like little Happy Meals on legs. You know? Oh, that's funny. It's like uh, you know what I I watched uh, I think I stopped watching it when uh she, her little sister came in. Yeah, it was way late in the series. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was like she was in college, and mm. I was like, "What just happened? I don't want to know her in college. I want her to. It could be like The Simpsons, where she's in high school forever." <laughs> and uh, but but I, were were there good later episodes? I don't know. There, there were probably were. There were some. I think I, I my my recollection of the later years is kind of hazy too. Right, right. But there was probably mm-hmm. you know like later like yeah. Yeah, I'm sure at least thirty percent were fun. Yeah. Anyway, I like the show. Yeah, it was a good uh, show. Yes. You know, and it's and it's one where it, even though it's a series, it's also episodic, so you could watch one episode and not be completely lost. And right. That you was don't really have amazing. to go. And they're like, you have to watch all of the Wire. And oh. I was like, I'm never watching all of the Wire. <laughs> Can I just watch four episodes of the Wire and know what the Wire is about? Yeah. And they're like, you're really gonna want to watch all. And I was like. I guess I won't then. I get the same and, thing from anime friends. My oh, friends right. are all like, oh, you've totally got to watch this anime. And I'll be like, okay, how many episodes are there? 740. <laughs> and I'm like, no. That will not be happening. Yes. Do you have four episodes that are a half an hour each yes. that I can get a flavor for who Naruto is? <laughs> That'll be fun. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I mean, there, there are encapsulated series that I've quite enjoyed that are that are very Finite. Oh yes, uh, you know for what, what? Oh, uh, Trigon, Trigon, Berserk, and um, Black Butler. Or two know. that are that yeah. you enjoyed yeah. early. And, and those are anime. Yeah. Okay. They're they're all different. Well, Trigon, I haven't watched the whole thing, but I watched enough of it to well, know it was, that it was good. It happened to be coming on after I was getting off work when I was working swing shift for a while. So oh, okay. I would watch them after work. But I I, uh, I went and bought the whole set, and then I immediately lost it in my house. My house does that. What's um, happening uh, with your house? Uh, is your house full of crap? What's, yes, because you lost your uh, phone, my phone in the house. in the house too. Yes. No, my I'm. I suppose at some point I'll be on hoarders, except that I don't watch that show. Right, right. And, um, well, probably because you don't need that sort of mirror, and uh, you're just like leave me. Except alone. I don't have anything dead in my house. Well, I have a bear skin, but um, that's dead. But it was it didn't die there. You you you're not a taxidermist. No, uh, you're not uh, hunting bear and no. then going. I need to skin this and put it up on my wall. <laughs> no, I you, got it when you... I worked at the thrift store. It happened oh, okay. to come in, and it's a little little one. And I mean, it was just one of those. Oh, it's things a baby where... bear. <laughs> I know that just makes it so much better. But I figured it's already a bear skin. I'm going to take care of it. Right. right. You, you didn't know. make it into a bear skin. No. It was, it's, it was, a uh, yes. yes. I know, it's, it's very much like old fur coats and stuff. Yeah, I'm, but, I'm like, you know, let's just use all the old fur coats and not make new ones, and then PETA can shut up. Yes. Anyway. <laughs> anyway. So, but the, okay, so the Cthulhu Necronomicon, so, Lovecraft. Yes. Lovecraft, what he did, because if you look at horror before Lovecraft, for mm-hmm. the most part, and, and this is a generalization, I'm not an expert on this topic. Right, right. Um, before Lovecraft, horror was almost certainly the supernatural. Okay. It was, ooh, ghosts. It was, ooh, devil. It was, ooh, you know, something. Yeah, I'm trying to think and, of stuff that was before Lovecraft. Would it just be like Frankenstein? And Well, there, there's actually a lot. There is a lot. But um, then there's, there's, you know, Frankenstein, Dracula, of course. Right. Um, ooh, vampires. Right. <laughs> there's, uh, you know, there's also Carmilla and the vampire. And there's a whole bunch of vampire stories that was very popular. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> there's Macon. Macon. Oh, I can never pronounce his name. It? 
M A C H E N. Okay, I'll, but it's I'll Welsh, so I'm pretty sure it's Macken. Okay, or so something. Monsters, Welsh monsters. Well, he did. He I actually was the Welsh is monstrous. Well, <laughs> Good for them. Well, he was one. Of, <laughs> he was one of Lovecraft's inspirations. Him and Lord Dunsany and. Um, oh, I just read that Lord Dunsany book. Yeah, uh, the main, the the famous one. Uh, the, uh, the, elf. the name can't remember. No, um, the. <laughs> Uh, I, I, yeah, I know the one you mean. Uh, It'll be in the notes. Yes. And, everybody's um, yelling at the, well, the, the their, their icons yelling their right names. now. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I know what you're talking about. You know. Well, but um, Mackin started some of the, you know, old gods and spooky gods and trying to mix a little bit of pseudoscience with horror. Now, we a lot of us think of Frankenstein as starting scientific horror, but really, if you read the book... I know it's been a long time since I've read the book, so again, could be wrong. Okay. I always admit it when I could be wrong, right, so nobody right. can tell me later. Right, but, right. And um, the thing is, is it's just enthusiasm. Oh, don't yeah. worry about it. So, but in 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 the original Frankenstein, you know, we we think of Frankenstein as being the movies with it's alive and electricity and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. But in the original book, it really didn't give any details. It could have been alchemy for all we know. Oh, okay. You know, it was how the body was brought back to life. wasn't It wasn't like outlined like a plan or anything. That was mostly incorporated into the movies. Okay. So while, and the focus of the book wasn't on horrific science, the focus on the book was on taking responsibility for the shit you do. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I right, forgot right. to ask. Oh, you. that was, that was your B plot? That was yeah. the, it, hey, why don't you get your act together? Uh, well, it was, yeah. it was, look, I made life. Yeah, now what are you going to do with it? Right, If right. you don't take this responsibility for this thing, it's going to go on a rampage and kill your family. Did yes. you think of that? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I love a I love a good B plot. Yeah. Cool. Anyway. So, uh, but okay. Anyway, so, back to my show. Back to and, your show. But, yeah. Oh, back to Lovecraft. That's where we. Got. That's where we I can, off. I can wander so far. <laughs> exactly. Um, but the yeah, album so, will go by very quickly once we start <laughs> weeding off. That's the so, way it goes. So, so Lovecraft though, what he started to do was mix some real, I mean, modern science from his time period, you know, with horror and bring out some really but make it st and it also passed a little bit into sci-fi okay he had these elder gods who were you know somewhere sealed in another dimension and could be opened up and let loose on the world at any point okay but they might also simply be some sort of ancient aliens oh okay you know and i mean he also had a story called the the shadow out of time where an alien race from way, way, way in the past okay. sends the consciousness of one of their people forward into the brain of a human, takes over the body, and learns what it can about our society, okay. and takes the information back. I mean, that's a very, very sci-fi theme. Yeah, yeah. But the story's told from this dude's point of view as he wakes up and realizes he's lost two years and tries to figure out what the heck happened to him. Oh. Or two years, three years, I don't Is, remember the Are details. they pretty well written? He's a very good writer when he's good. Some of his stuff is kind of cheesy okay. by modern standards. Sure. Um, he was writing for pay, and some of his stories show that. And he oh, he also word count well, yeah. kind of sort of. <laughs> and he was and he was kind of embarrassed by some of his stories. Okay. But his mastery of language is really really good. He uses a lot of. He, you need a thesaurus sometimes. You okay. know, at least a dictionary. When you're when you're reading Lovecraft, he, well, he makes up a lot of words, right? He, but he also has he a makes good... up some of his monster names and things. Okay, but he uses language effectively. He has okay. a really good mastery of, and and if you hear the stories aloud, there's a certain rhythm and music to his language also, which is really neat. fascinating. Okay, I wonder if they have those on Audible. Oh, uh, if not on Audible, I've done a bunch of readings that are on my site. Okay. And Which is 19notturnboulevard.com, by the way. Yes, dot .com and dot .net. And dot .net. Okay. <laughs> and, and uh, yeah, my site's kind of messed up right now, but all this, the links mostly are there. Okay. It, it, I had a computer crashes over the summer. I had a couple okay. of major computer crashes, and so I haven't been able to update the site in like four months until just recently when I found time. And because the program I had was on the old computer, which... You can't have it on the new computer, so I had to get another old computer to get the okay. program, because otherwise I had to scrap the whole site and start over, and it's just been crazy. Okay. You know. Wow. It's All nice right. when well, you work in uh, obsolete tools that are basically, I tell people, no, my site's building front page, and they're like, oh, is that the bird with the chisel in the back of the camera <laughs> from Fred Flintstone days? So is and front page not HTML? It's its own like, it, sort it of is word apparently kind of HTML. Well, eventually, actually, like if you go deep enough, everything is HTML. But I guess. Um, <laughs> But front page is some sort of like Dreamweaver it's, kind of tool. It's a WYSIWYG thing, you know. Okay. And it's, I see. The problem is, I'm everything for my show. 
So okay. every hour I you spend are trying to... Band. Yeah. Okay. Or a one-woman butt-kicking army, as I have posted on Fair many enough. of my there you signature go. blogs. Own it! <laughs> <laughs> but so, so every hour I spend trying to fix the website, which is not something that is... I'm comfortable... That you're interested yeah, in. Yeah. Yes. Is an hour I'm not writing, is an hour I'm not acting, is an hour I'm not mixing the next show. Which is the, the real love. Yeah. That's the thing you really want to do. Yeah. So you write... So if, if 19 Nocturne is the flagship, what else is there? Okay, 19 Nocturne is my big anthology series. There's uh, 83 episodes of that so far. Okay. Wow. I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I did get it out on a very regular basis. Yeah. Um, out of it spun off The Dead Eye Kid, which is a Western, which, again, it, it was something where I had a little extra time and I was putting out short episodes on a regular okay. basis, and then it sort of fizzled because I ran out of time. Sure. But I've got to, I want to continue it. It's I think episodic I'm gonna, anyway. Right? Yeah, I think I'm going to bring it back in. Well, no, that one was more of a serial. It was like five or six episodes made a story. Okay. And, and how many episodes are there? Are there five or six? There, there's two completed stories and a third that is as yet incomplete. I have all the voices. Two that are published. Well, they're, they're, they're all, up. they're all, we'll see, all it's, up? yeah, they're all up. The third one is missing the last two episodes because I have the voices. I just don't have the time to put it together. Right, right. I'm working on getting back to that and people keep nagging me about it. Right. No, no yeah, <laughs> yeah, know. but it's, um, the, how long is the Dead Eye Kid episode? One well, episode there, of that. Originally there were three episodes of the Dead Eye Kid that appeared in 19 Nocturne Boulevard that were if self contained half hour stories. Okay. And then I spun it off into a serial to try and do it on its own. And and it's good. It's it's a weird western, but not a overly weird western. It's, okay. It's it's a western. Well, part of the MacGuffin of it, which I sh is spoiler alert, <laughs> is that Lemuel Roberts, the Dead Eye Kid, is a retired right. gunslinger is trying to do well and sure. you know, make up for his checkered past. You know, and uh, he sees ghosts. Okay. He can talk to ghosts. Okay. And that's part of the MacGuffin. That's not the whole thing. You still have to listen to it. Sure. You know, and he's traveling the West with this British travel writer, Clarence Fanshawe, who right. is sort of your classic, you know, pretty sort of, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you like to, so you're creating characters that are sort of, they're, they're, uh, I'm, I can't forget the, uh, it's going to sound, this is the wrong word. They're sort of, they're, they're. Standard characters. They're well, characters stereotypes. From, I mean, you start with a stereotype and then you build outward from it. Right, right. And you make them your own and you yeah. make it into, you know, his own backstory and, and their own lives and their oh, own yeah. adventures. Well, especially when you're working in a half hour time frame, you have to start with stereotypes a lot of the time yeah. because you have to, you know, within five minutes, the, the listener has to know who those characters are because you don't have more than five minutes to start it before you get again, got to have the plot started. Mm hmm. And this has always been a fun part of uh, writing is that establishing characters really fast yeah. is a huge deal. And, I mean, I did study screenwriting for a while. Right. Before I started doing the, the audio dramas. Right. And, and then I realized that I just don't have that drive to go down to L.A. and beat on people's doors and try and get them to read my stuff. Right. And it's better to just make the thing you want to make exactly. anyway, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah super I mean, fun. this way I don't have to I don't have to find an audience. I just throw it out there and somebody will download it. Right. And yeah. and, and whoever downloads it and enjoys it, that's the that's its own reward. My buddy yeah. Joe Wilson, who used to co host the Dork for us, uh -huh. that's what he did with he did a, a two seasons of a video of like three to five minute episodes. Six, I think, six episodes per season about a vamp. It's called Vampire Mob, Ooh, and it's okay. uh, about a hitman who's a vampire who um, decides to make his wife into a vampire because he loves her and he wants <laughs> to be with her forever. And then she, that always works, right? And then she bites her mother, and then she uh, her, and then it's essentially. Uh, her mom moves in, and he is constantly having to kill people and get lunch for everybody. And uh, but he works at night anyway. Yeah. So, but it's vampiremob.com dot com is a is a is a is a fun and it's but it's not audio. But that's his whole thing too about how oh, yeah. he because he did write screenplays. He wrote a lot of really he wrote a really great. Uh, it was it was a it was about lawnmower racing. It was sort of a happy <laughs> Gilmore. Interesting. With, with lawnmower racing, because lawnmower racing is real. Mm -hmm. And you're like, what's happening? People are racing, they're riding mowers? And he's like, oh, yes. Do they race their push mowers? They do <laughs> not. I wish they did. <laughs> that would be hilarious. That would be the pushing. Well, see, now, the with with me, I wrote, I, I got a couple of, you know, minor, like, third place in this contest or that contest. And, mm -hmm. you know, and so I, I know I've got 
something new and for right, me. Right, right. People but, are enjoying it. Yeah. yeah. And I have one thing that's kind of stuck in development hell, which is my dead serial killer buddy movie. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> is it also ghosts? There's a ghost. Well, there's potentially a ghost. That's the difficult a dead, part. A dead serial killer? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, but if he's a, we're not sure whether he's a ghost or just, you know, post-traumatic stress. Oh, okay. So, um, but, you know, so the, the problem was, you know, I could write a stack of screenplays taller than my head and still have nothing to show for it, right. but a stack of screenplays taller than my head. Right, right, that everybody could find later after they died. <laughs> yeah, and, after uh, they crush me. Right. And <laughs> so, so instead, being able to do this, I can make a finished product. And I don't have to rely on anybody else. Mm-hmm. You know, I can get the voices. I mean, I need the actors. But yeah. I could even do it myself if I had to. There's right. actually several shows out now that are one person doing all the voices kind of things. Okay. That are surprisingly effective. And they're and, the ones that you did? Oh, no, no. These are various other people out in the... I was uh, going to ask you about that. Do you end up listening to a lot of other Oh, yes. Stuff? There's a lot of really great stuff out here. What's some of the favorite stuff that people might enjoy, in addition well, to your own, of course? Well, I mean, locally, we have a lot of talent. I mean, actually, physically, locally. Um, do they do live shows? Oh, not usually. Now, there's okay. a, there's some people down in California. The, the Thrilling um, Adventure guys. Uh, yeah. I think, yeah. Well, no, wait, no, no, no. Um, this is, I think it's a different name. Uh, the people who do uh, tales from the Extra- tales of the extraordinary, okay, they do something called dungeon dungeon. It's like a Dungeons and Dragons thing, and now I'm just blanking on the name because, of course, I figured I would never get to go. Right, <laughs> and- <laughs> right, right. But tales of the extraordinary. I'll Google that. Oh yeah, and they're fun. They do like a 1920s serial classic, you know, crazy adventure. You know, ooh, I'm the British you know, archaeologist yeah. kind of, you know. And, well, fun, fun. Oh, it's hilarious. And um, But what's some local one? You said there was oh, a local locally, one that you really like? Well, locally, um, we have Gypsy Co. Well, Gypsy Audio, which is uh, Gwendolyn Jensen Woodard. She's down this way. And she does a, um ongoing, like, a supernatural soap opera. Okay. And my one of my protégés, Kimberly Poole, who, I mean, I taught her how to mix after I learned how to mix. Right, right. Actually, the coolest part is I had a lot of people coming to me and going, ooh, can I submit a script? And I'm like, dude, I'm a writer who learned to produce. I'm producing yeah. my writing. Yeah, yeah. I'll teach you how to produce. And they all and go... And then you can do your own thing. Yeah, but usually they'd be like... Do you know anybody who's looking for scripts? Right, right. They don't, I mean, yeah. Because of how much work it is, you know? And that's exactly. the thing. And and you're like, yeah, you could do it yourself, but you have to figure out how to do it. Exactly. But so when Kim came to me and goes, I have this idea for a show, and I'm like, I'll teach you how to produce. She's like, Friday? Yeah, there you and go. And I'm like, hey, that's cool. So what program do you work she, in? She does Warped Space. Oh, her show is called Warped Space, and it's okay. actually in my feed. Okay. So and it's and it's a space adventure. It's, it's a space adventure. It's a it's a straightforward sort of um, you know colony ship. Things are happening. It's it's more of a drama than anything else. Okay. It's not one of you know, uh, a friend of Andy's, um, Christian Brown, does this thing called it's a live action role playing game. Uh huh. But he does it every month, and he wants to syndicate it, and he wants to turn it into sort of role playing books where you can set up your own mods, mm-hmm. and um, it's called Starship Valkyrie. Okay. And the thing about live action role playing game, it's sort of like a costume party with orders. Oh, trust and... me, I've been LARPing for twenty five years. Have you? I never, I never did until I met oh, yeah. Andy. And those guys are, I mean, and there's like, there's, I guess there's two different kinds. There's yeah. your boffer uh, LARPing, and mm-hmm. then there's more of your acting LARPing. No, you can mix them. There's a group locally well, called sure. Legacies that Kim is heavily involved in. Yeah. And they do. It's it's a fantasy LARP. It's a fantasy LARP. And what? There's hitting? There's boffers? Yeah, there's, there's boffers. Okay. But there's a lot of problem solving and interaction as well. Yeah, and yeah. But I because th- I know that his buddy Lee does more boffer stuff. Uh-huh. And, um, well, but there's, there's always like puzzles and, and, yeah. and missions and, and well, whatnot. A lot of them are, there's one called Amphgar, which is mostly How do you spell Amphgar? Amphgar, A-M-F-G-A-R, I okay. think. I'm not, it's not my no words. But they're more like the one, if you ever saw Role Models. Nope. Which is more like, you know, war type stuff. Beat okay. the cra- everybody beats the crap out of each other. Role Models is actually kind of hilarious in their treatment of LARPers. The movie? Yeah. Okay. Um, and But it's actually not a, a, an embarrassing portrayal of LARPers, which is nice. It's just That a, is nice, because you know? um, that's, that's part of the problem, is, is that you're just like, hey, uh, you played Army when you were a kid, and now you watch 19,000 hours of NFL football. So yeah. how about somebody else has a hobby, yeah. and it involves going outside and playing Army with their 30-year-old friends. Exactly. So, <laughs> but it, it all ties together, because, I mean, I've done role-playing games for most of my life, and that's one reason where I picked up a lot of, like, 
writing different characters, creating characters, yeah. figuring out what their background is and how it affects how they behave. And so yeah. that's, it all sort of boils right back into the writing. It's just that now I script everything. Yes. And uh, that's one of the things. It's, it's just, it's know. more structure. You know? Yeah. I mean, that's all a script is. is it, it's Because mm-hmm. cause Andy's always trying to get me to LARP. It's like acting and it's like improv and you would like, uh, and I've done two. Uh, and I wasn't, I mean, there. It's not everybody's thing. And it was fun. I did, um, he, Andy ran, he did a series, and the last one he did, him and his buddy Lee put up this, a Sandman LARP, uh-huh. um, the Neil Gaiman okay. series, and um, it was based on sort of the wake, mm-hmm. but it was essentially, and you would have loved this, because <laughs> it was, um, it was, they, they didn't know, it wasn't Dream who was dying for sure. The entire LARP was based on the fact that one of the nine endless were going to die. Mm. So they needed nine one-act plays of how each person would die. And then oh, wow. there would be a decision made. So it was, you know, six hours at a theater with uh-huh. 47 players. And I was like, I will do craft services. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and my friend Maria Bamford was... Um, and then I said, and I will be an extra. I'll uh-huh. go and I'll deliver like a note to Odin. Or whatever, or what, you know, whatever's happening, and so um, they cast uh, they cast us in a couple of the to play extra parts. And Maria, they still talk about because Maria auditions a lot, uh-huh. and uh, so she acts a lot. And she played; she was in the Death of Desire, uh-huh. and the Death of Desire uh, short play was done um, was written, I think, and acted by Jim Keller. And this guy, whatever you don't know, him. <laughs> and uh, That's okay. perfectly nice man. Anyway, so. Maria played apathy, which mm-hmm. is what killed desire. <laughs> which was very funny, and Maria freaking nailed it. You oh, know, good. she knocked it out of the. So it's like that. Well, like my friend Kim, she her different characters. That she has several different characters she plays at Legacies. Yeah, and she is tickled to death that people have different opinions of her different characters, and it's very important to her. Yeah. She actually even packs different bedding for different characters. I mean, everything. When she switches characters in the middle of a game, her whole area switches. Okay. You know, but... like, Wait, So what? T- talk to me more about legacies. Why is she oh, switching characters? What's uh, happening? During the game, the game lasts for a weekend. Okay. And what? so everybody's allowed to switch characters at some point once. Oh, okay. Right? So you can play two different characters over the course All right. of the game. And she, but you, you, so you bring two of your four. You, you're allowed to have up to four that you're playing... Okay. At one time, roughly. So you bring two kits. Yes, basically. And, you know, one of her characters... And does one of them die, maybe? That's, well, that's one reason you bring an extra, just in case. Because okay. it is always possible for a character to die. It's true. And But, like, one of her characters is... She, she runs the bar, she cooks the food, everybody trusts her, everybody goes to her for help and healing and stuff. She's, like, you know, the, the, the mama character. And, and, and then one of her other characters is, like, people are scared of her because she is creepy. She has, like, the, the, the ninja kind of black outfit on. Okay. And she, and, and, and you know, and, and she just scares people. She's right. just a little bit edgy <laughs> and a little bit creepy. And she has a tendency to, um, to, to do things to put people off specifically. But, but she's, you know, pleased with the fact that she can play these characters so differently mm-hmm. that people are specifically... Reacting. You know, reacting in different ways that's to them. Neat. That's neat. Yeah. That's cool. I mean, and that's that's one of the funnest things about a, a lot of the acting and stuff. I mean, like role playing games in general. I mean, I role played for many years. I even had my own fanzine that I put out before. <laughs> before you started. <laughs> before doing I started doing this. Yeah, yeah. It was called Serendipity Circle, and it's still available sometimes on the internet. We're okay. trying. We keep trying to put it out in PDF form, except that it was all put together in like some previous. Previous version of Quark Express that doesn't talk to modern versions, and Steve's got to get a converter, and blah, blah, blah. and half the post production work was done with me and a glue stick, so we have to scan the pictures in again. Right. Blah. So do you work in? So here's so in your audio world, uh-huh. uh, when you do production, let's get back to that okay. real quickly. What software are you oh, using for that? I use Audacity. Oh, do you use Audacity? Oh, yeah. Because that's what I use here at the Dork Forest. I just, uh, uh, and I and I had a little bit of a lesson from Patrick uh, Brady, who fixes the audio, uh, of how to compress and and bring it down and, and make it nice. Uh, and that's why I have to get room tone. He's, uh-huh. he's like, you got to get room tone so I can use room tone. And I was like, so you can do I am on noise board. removal. Yay. Yeah, yeah, noise removal. Yeah. yeah. It was it was, uh, it was a great lesson. So that's what you do. That's oh, what yeah. you did? Yeah. You and I actually also have a blog where I've talked about some of the technicalities of Audacity and stuff. I'm not a tech head, but once I master something, 
I yeah. can explain it in a way that anyone can understand it. Okay. That's yeah. my that's my special ability. Right, right. You're like, um, you know. I, it will take me for because yeah, it takes me forever to learn something, but once I learn it, mm. I should be able to explain it to you in a yeah. clear, concise way that will not drive you mad. Yeah, yeah. It's like you know, trying to explain people what a high pass filter is or something. You know, oh, right, right, yeah. And so, so that's what you do it in. Well, that's yeah, and okay. and people are always telling me, oh, you can't do noise removal in Audacity, and my answer is, you can't. Uh, it's in the drop down menu. I, I can't don't understand. understand. It works great. It seems to work out just fine. Well, people listen to my shows and they're like, oh my God, that's beautiful. What do you mix in? I'm like, Audacity. They're like, how the heck did you mix something that good in Audacity? Why I'm did like, you spend $1,800 on Pro Tools. Oh, I know. I know it. It's, uh, I don't, I also, because I used to do it in Gold Wave, mm -hmm. which uh, is a very old. Oh, uh, I've had Gold Wave from time to time. And it's it, it's what I make the MP3s for the phone bonus if Patrick can't do it because uh. he has a job and a life, and so and <laughs> and I'll do the I'll do the the phone bonuses just because they're super short. Mm. But um, yeah, Gold Wave is pretty shitty. Um, they, I I know people who work in it and are perfectly happy with it. Yeah, I, I mean, it's you, not. I, yeah, you know. I bet you if there's a way to 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 be able to massage yeah. it and use it in a yeah. way that makes it effective. Part of the big deal is just find what where the interface it makes you happy. I mean, whatever's going to work for you. I know people who spend a bazillion dollars and they've got the huge screen so they can have fourteen tracks running. And I'm like, no, I'll do I my think stuff. That those are techie yeah. dorks too. The, yeah, they like to look at a giant toy. Oh yeah, and make there's, it all work together. Yeah. Okay. But I mean, Audacity works. Fine. Right. You know, and um, I mean, because I get, I'm constantly getting complimented on the quality, the sound quality of my shows, in oh, addition yeah. to the acting quality, in addition to the writing quality. Right, right. Uh, everyone's enjoying the content, but yeah. they're also like, hey, I can hear it. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, like, <laughs> like in, I just put out my adaptation of Lovecraft's The Rats in the Walls. Okay. Speaking back to his sci fi yeah. connections, this was uh, one of the expressions of his fear of heredity. Oddly enough, of the idea that whatever your ancestors do, you were doomed to do. Okay, obviously some daddy issues. Let's hear oh, Lovecraft. Oh, he had <laughs> so many issues. Well, Lovecraft, one of the things that made him an effective horror writer is that he was writing from a place of fear. Okay. I mean, he really was. <laughs> I mean, this may not be the technical term for it, but... No, no, but that is the best. But, I love that. You know, he, he writes about things he's afraid of. He was very racist, but he was okay. writing in the 20s. But it's because he's afraid of anything that's different from what he right, is. Right, right. Yeah. Or at least that's the way it really reads to me. He he never he did, was never comfortable including female characters because mm -hmm. he was afraid of women. Right. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> and, yeah. Well, and that's all racism and misogyny is. Is it, you're terrified. Yeah. And uh, and and so you know, or resentful. There's part of that too. But mm -hmm. um, but anyway, I mean, so he he was writing from fear, and he was his family had sort of a checkered past, and he was scared to death that he was doomed to repeat it. You right. Know? And so the fear of heredity is there. Mm -hmm. But when I rewrote the story, when I adapted it, among other things, I changed the main character to a woman. Mm -hmm. But um, well, it's a, it's an it's an older character. It's a you know somebody in and it's on Nocturne as well. Yeah, yeah. it just came and what's out. What's it called? Uh, this is called The Rats in the Walls. Okay. And it's it's not going to be on the .dot com website yet because I haven't updated it again. Is it .dot net? But um, .dot com .dot net. They both route there eventually. But um, it's actually a Spelled out, and I, I'll give you. The, I'll give you the link to the RSS page. Everything is on, is on the RSS page, no matter what. That's the one. Who's your Who's your host? Uh, Libsyn. Libsyn? You doing a Libsyn host? Okay. Yeah. So it's on that page for sure. Yeah. Okay. And it's right there. So that way, at least, and I'll link it. You put it in the links. Mm -hmm. But yeah, in this one, the story was is, is an old dude who goes back to the house uh, that his ancestors had in England. He's grown up in the U.S. His family's mm -hmm. been in the U.S. for three hundred years. Um, his son died recently in world war one mm -hmm. and and had been over there and found the house and they go back to it's a big old exum priory and he buys it and then discovers and renovates it and then discovers that there's horrible stuff in the basement that implies that the family were doing horrible culty stuff you know way back right when. and this is the lovecraft story. yeah yeah so I, I but but then at the end it's like oh look my family did this oh i'm doomed or you know right and, <laughs> which doesn't fly for a modern audience the same way so i had to build in more motivation and do all this other stuff and change right. it mm -hmm. and so i i did and i think it's very successful mm -hmm. but it's that's part of the Super challenge yeah. of adapting lovecraft is to make it keep as much of the story intact and integral as possible, but at the same time layer it so that the modern audience isn't going what? Right, right, right. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. There's a lot of um, 
there's a lot of film, I guess, that's been done. Lovecraft mm-hmm. movies. A lot of a lot of crap. And, and some uh, good ones, but mostly crap. <laughs> right, right. But I think that it's all... I mean, I think that, that Lovecraft, as far as I can tell from everyone who's ever talked about it, because there's yeah. like Lovecraft film festivals. Yep. And um, is that is that you're working from Lovecraft, which was kind of crap. So you, and then when you create something from crap, it's going to be crap. So if you, I mean, there's not a lot of people who can fix it. No, no, it's not that it's crap. It's that the the integral underlying what he writes, Mm -hmm. the goodness of what he writes is almost entirely in the language and the fact that he alludes to things, but never really shows you them. And the problem with so that's transferring that to, make that into to a, transfer into a, video into because you're losing the medium. language, yeah, yeah, and you're having to show it, and, and so you're having to show something he never described exactly, so. and he wouldn't describe because the non-description of it is much more creepy yes. than anything you can ever right. show people because everything in everybody's heads yes. is much more terrifying. Now, now, than, now, the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society. Where's that? Uh, He's somewhere in the world on the internet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're on the internet. They've done a number. They also do audio dramas, but theirs are CDs for sale. Okay. And theirs are they come with all sorts of really cool like handouts, like little newspapers and stuff. So okay. it's yeah, worth yeah. it. Um, they're more traditional in their adaptations. Mine take a weird turn sometimes because I do do things like explore the motivations of the the monsters, right, right. characters and yeah. stuff, you know, yeah. and and add more. I mean, and, and flesh out the stories and stuff. So it's it's we're we're on different tracks. Right. But they did a really brilliant version of the Call of Cthulhu, the movie. They made a movie of it. Okay. But they did it as a silent film. Okay. As I mean, well. they did it in the style of a 1920 silent film, and it is wonderful. They also oh, that's did. Neat. Another of his stories, The Whisper in Darkness, but did it more as sort of a 1930s sci-fi film. Right. And so they, they've, they've really played with some of that, and that's been really, really good stuff. Oh, that's cool. And that's yeah. a, what historical society? is? H.P. Lovecraft Historical, historical Society. Oddly enough. There'll be a link, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> anyway, back to me, though. <laughs> Please. No, no, and the thing, so yeah. I, I like, um, so, but it's interesting that you do... Like, full half-hour episodes of this well, stuff. Well, and actually, The Rats in the Walls is an hour long. Right. Because all the ones that... The only ones that I've ever seen is uh, Paul F. Tompkins, right? Okay. Um, he's, he, does, he does one, and then the Thrilling Adventure Hour guys. Yeah. And they seem to be three to five minute, like... Sparks Nevada mm-hmm. is a um, is a westerny is oh it's a it's a it's a western that takes place on Mars mm-hmm. and um, and it's 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 serially kind of like um, yeah well there's a lot of serial the rocketeery yeah. kind yeah. of stuff well if you go back to old time radio yeah they, you had both the half hour dramas and the serials okay running I mean this serials were more often adventure type stories for kids like Flash Gordon and stuff yeah or um, I love a mystery or um, I Love a Mystery was a classic. It's yeah. three dudes, Jack, Doc, and Reggie, who <laughs> go places and beat the crap out of things, you know. Yeah, yeah. And um, star Tony Randall played Reggie. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. It, a terrible British accent, but, you know. Sure, sure. But who, uh, yeah, I, I've, I've yet to see a good one. So, uh, From a, yeah, well, anyway. Yeah. Well, I can do, I do several different British characters in my shows, but, yeah. you know. Um, then... Uh, uh, but you know, and there was soap operas, of course, which were serialized. Okay. But um, but you know, they also had the half hour shows in classic old time radio, and the shadow. Like yeah, the shadow stuff? lights out. Um, there, there's bazillions of them. Whether they're comedies, whether they're uh, mysteries, whether they're horror. Every genre. Pretty much. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. You know, I never listened to. I oh, mean, old time radio. There's a huge piles of stuff available on the internet. Just the just just. Yeah. Hours and hours, oh, yeah. or hundreds of hours, or thousands oh, yeah. of hours, or the the encoding quality is variable because a lot of stuff, <laughs> a okay. lot of stuff got compressed at some point, and so you get a lot of the chimey artifacts going. Okay, and okay. you'll know them if you hear them. It's just and so. So if I Google old time radio, I would look for well. There, there's ways to find specific shows, which I, might be a better thing to do. You'd have to know the names. Well, like, look for Lights Out or look for... Um, which might lead you through a yeah. rabbit hole of links. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I mean, some of my favorites are like Lights Out. If you want a good episode, listen to Revolt of the Worms. Okay. Or um, Chicken Heart, of course. Right. <laughs> but the Lights Out actually had a lot of really good episodes. Okay. Um I, Revolt of the Worms is my favorite because okay. it's really dark. And I mean, Light, Lights Out is a scary show. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And also Quiet Please is another square, scary show, which would had a slightly different format, but it was also really good. Okay. 
Um, there's a whole range of them. Uh, of all things, one of my favorite shows was a kid's serial called Firefighters, which nobody's ever heard of. But it was... Was it about firefighters? Oddly enough, yes. Wow! <laughs> but but it, was, it was... It was actually a really good kid's show, and it yeah. was just about firefighters. Yeah, I don't yeah. know why. I, but, who doesn't love firemen? Well, part of it has to do with, you know, whether it's written well, whether it's acted well, whether it's compelling in the story, you yeah. know, and it happened to work for me. Oh, great. I mean, a lot of kids' shows even today are just... They're not good. Terrible, you know. Yeah. They talk down to kids or something. But anyway, um, so a lot of these have, you know, really educated me on how I wanted to write stuff. Yes. But also a lot of what I write comes from role-playing games because I... For years, I was the, the game master. I was the person running the games. Yeah. So I was writing the scenarios. Because you get to write. That's, yeah. I mean, that's its own but, writing. Oh, experience. even better. You get to play all the other characters. Oh, right. oh that's right. Because you when you're play a, the NPCs or yeah. something, non-player characters. Because when it's a tabletop game, you are everyone else. Right. Right. You know, but, but you also get to create the world and the yeah. and the situations and the. I mean, it, it's, yeah. it's definitely a writing exercise. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But part of the fun also, though, is that uh, one of the things that separates tabletop role playing from computer role playing, and I'm a purist. Computer role playing is only barely counts as far as I'm concerned. What's computer role playing? Are you talking oh, about like, um, like World, World of Warcraft, Warcraft and stuff, where your character Sky goes Rim. oh when it gets hit? That's not really role playing. Or, or where you have, like, five choices of things that you can bring up as a yes. topic and get responses. That's yes. not role-playing. That's clicking you, buttons. You, right. You would, like, you would like more options, is what you're saying. Exactly. Do you, do you play any video games? Plants vs. Zombies. <laughs> oh, Plants vs. Zombies is fun. Isn't that a, a, a Facebook uh, iPad game kind of situation? Uh, right? I get it through Big Fish. I don't okay, know. Okay, yeah. But, so it's, but it's a computer game yeah. on your PC, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Just a silly thing. So it's not like, like Link. And it's not a Zelda like no. a handheld. No, I like to watch people play games on YouTube. I have the bigger, more extensive games. Oh. I, I, I'm particularly addicted to Morphar right now. But anyway. How do you spell Morphar? M-O-R-F-A-R. Is it a... He's a Swedish dude. I um, mean, he, he speaks he speaks English. It's not right. in Swedish, but he play, he does these playthroughs and he has his you know. Uh, you like to watch the playthroughs on YouTube? Yeah, I know. Awesome! <laughs> oh, that's because I've only seen like a couple of them and they are compelling. Oh, he's hilarious too because he's he's narrating in English, but if he gets scared, yeah, because he plays horror games, he starts screaming in Swedish. <laughs> <laughs> so is he playing like Diablo? Or something, um, or? Amnesia. Okay, just um, horror. Lucius. I mean, just a bunch of oddball horror games. Yeah. Okay, all right. Anyway, but so for, for me, though, one of the problems that you, things you lose in playing a video game rather than a live tabletop game is if you come up with something that you want to do that the, the computer can't deal with, you don't have an option. Right. You don't have a game master to turn to and say, you know what, I'm actually not going to go through that door yeah. at all, ever. Because one of my favorite stories is yeah. when one of the times I got to play, yep. my character, and this was a cyberpunkish game, and in this world it's Slay Industries, and in the world they have a this crazed, um, they're, they're basically berserker-type Fighters, okay, and they don't tell you that the frothers are specifically mad Scotsmen, okay, but they do come equipped with a kilt and a claymore, okay, so they must. Be. And the book was written by Mad Scotsmen, so it's okay. Which book? <laughs> Slay Industries, the okay. game, the game book. Okay, got it. So I was playing this character who's a and this is stick. a tabletop, game. yeah, okay. And my character happened to be one of these mad Scotsmen, mm -hmm. and the scenario that the GM was was putting to us was that. There's this 50-story building, and there's a terrorist who's got hostages on the top floor, and we had and he's booby trapped the building. So we're trying to get up there to rescue the hostages. Right. And as we're going through all these booby traps and the stairwells and the elevator, he's coming on our headset and going, I'd like to introduce you to somebody. What's your name? Mary. Do you want to die, Mary? No, no. <sighs> you know, and we're getting more and more oh, right, right. angry. Yeah, you know. didn't. So we get outside the door. We know we're outside the door of the conference room or whatever where he's got them trapped. And he goes, and he goes, comes on the headset one more time and goes, oh, by the way, did I forget to mention that all the remaining bombs in the building are linked to my heartbeat? So if I die, the whole building's going to explode. Oh. And my character, or me, you know, yes. <laughs> we try not to speak of them in third person. It annoys them. Okay. He goes, right, I've got a plan. <laughs> and everybody goes, uh oh. <laughs> Stig's got a plan. I'm like, I've got 50 feet of rope. I'm going to tie one end to my ankle and one end to something that will not move. I'm going to kick in the door, shoot out the window behind the bastard, and we're both going out the flipping window. And the GM's just like, 
Eh? Uh-huh. <laughs> and then he starts rolling dice as he tries to figure out what to do with this. <laughs> right, right, right. Let's do, give me a minute. Give yeah. Me a minute. <laughs> so he's like, okay, you succeed. You're hanging out the window. And 50 stories up, right. he's not dead, but he needs new trousers. Oh, hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, because that's what you lose if you don't have a person there. Right. Right, but... um. <sighs> Yes. I mean, I, I I know that people who really, I mean, like, I like video games just because I like the graphics and mm. I like oh, yeah. the, you know, but I also like, uh, like, I never thought I would like board games or tabletop games, like, but I really do. And mm. it's, um, but everybody plays them so differently. Like, in, 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 the, in the D&D game that I play, I want to kill something and then roll the body. <laughs> and uh, as does everyone who I'm playing with, yeah. uh, but like you know, John and Lee, and <laughs> they uh, enjoy a political moment where they want to talk to the Goblin King at length and figure out what has happened. <laughs> and uh, and I'm like, it, did it, you really want to figure out what happened? Because I want to go get a sandwich. And <laughs> well, it it really depends on the group you're into. I mean, yeah. I moved out of fantasy games because I'm not a combat GM. Okay. And moved into more of the sci-fi, I mean, more of a modern-day horror investigation X-Files type stuff. Okay. That's what, what I, that's is, what is I that ran. what you're playing now? Well, I haven't played, played in anything? years because okay. I just don't have time and it's right, hard right, to get you, a group you, together. Now you're doing this. And now I'm doing this. Which is, you know <laughs> what, I have this to say, uh, Julie Hoverson, uh, yeah. it has been an hour. Oh no! I know it! I know it! This was fascinating. <laughs> This was awesome. I uh, can, can I do one little short last plug? Yeah, yeah, okay. please, please Cause, do. Because uh, I've I've won three awards okay. so far um, and placed in a couple's. I've won two Mark Time Awards and an Ogle Award. These okay. are one, some of the few internet audio awards that are available. Out okay, there. there's also yeah. I've also been a finalist in the Parsecs once, and I've been a finalist in the Horspiel Summer Leipzig okay. in Germany. Yes. Hey, Germany actually has a big audio drama. Yeah, yeah. Community because they still have it produced professionally there. Right, right. So, um, so you want to plug? Yeah, I want to just plug those episodes as as example episodes that people might want to listen to. Yeah, yeah. Um, my first Mark Time Award was called The Outpost, mm-hmm. which is a sci fi piece. Mm-hmm. The second one is called the, is the Rookie, which is a dark future where crazed serial killers roam the halls and they are the pop icons of the day. And people actually, you know, it's, right. it's one of those depressive futures. Okay, and it's all about a. A young serial who gets taken under the wing of an old retired serial. And All right. She, yeah. There's nothing like hearing, you know, a character like Archie Bunker's wife being, Oh, do you remember what my what my old modus operandi was? <laughs> I used to hamstring young men and then stomp them to death, you know. <laughs> I play a lot of crazy old ladies. And the third award I just won was uh, the Ogle, which is, those are for sci-fi. This one's for fantasy and horror. And okay. it's uh, called... Ghost of a Chance, which is about a little girl who lives with ghosts. All right, and it's very family friendly, actually, okay. apart from a couple languages. Okay, so just just a little bit of a little yeah. bit of cussing, maybe. Yeah, and uh, so those three episodes are good starting points because yeah. they're they're all award winners. Yep, and people should listen to those. All right, uh, hey, Dork Forest people, uh, you've chosen wisely. This was a great episode. Thank you so much, Julie. My hat, my hat, my hat. They're dancing around my hat. <laughs> My hat, my hat, my hat. Well, what do you think of that? If it looks like a Mexican hat dance and it sounds like a Mexican hat dance, it's most likely a Mexican hat dance. So take off your hat and let's dance. Yay! Oh, my God. We, why don't we just call that as the end of the show?